with any project that you're working on, one of the first decisions that you make is going to be what format you're going to render in. Rendering may be the last thing you do in the project, but you should always decide what you're doing with rendering first. The rendering options will depend on which interface you're using in OpenTunes. Over here I have a custom interface which I'm using and I have the standard file menu. So if I click under file, we will see output settings and render. To render, we will just click on render itself and that will render whatever output settings you have for that project. If you click on output settings, this is going to give you all the options for what you are going to render. First, you're going to have a preset. Presets will allow you to save all the settings in the output settings window. Once you've saved a preset, you can then just refer to the preset at the next project. To create a preset, we just click on Add and name our preset. Then if ever we want to go back to these settings, we can just choose the preset. If I just change anything over here and go back to the preset, it will revert everything to that preset. The next option is the camera settings. The camera settings do not have to be edited in the output settings. If we go to Windows and then Schematic, we will get the schematic and we will see that the schematic has a camera over here. We can add any number of cameras to the scene and all the cameras can have different settings. You can use the cameras in various ways. You can choose to make the scene where you cut between different cameras. Or you can use different cameras to allow you to frame the scene for different resolutions for each camera. So if we were to create a couple of cameras, we could change the resolution on all of these cameras to different things. Now all the cameras have a separate resolution. If I wanted to change the rendering resolution, I can just change the camera setting over here in the output. Once you've set up the cameras, you can render the scene with whichever camera you choose. So if we go over here under output settings, we could then swap between the various cameras. If we return to the camera settings on camera 1 and look at the camera settings by themselves, we will see that the first settings are the size of the camera. We will see that there are various locks. The locks allow you to change certain aspects of the camera settings without changing any of the others. What we will see is we have the camera settings in inches. If I go to Preferences, if I then go to Interface, you'll see that you can change your choices for units within the scene. I'm going to leave the camera units as inches, even though I don't really use inches and I generally work in metric. Most resolutions are generally given with their imperial numbers, although that makes very little difference because the most important factor in your image resolution is actually the aspect ratio and not the units used to measure it. So we'll return to the camera settings. We'll have the measurements in inches. In OpenTunes the aspect ratio is actually showing the final output size of the image and not the basic ratio. The basic ratio would usually be something like 4 over 3 or 16 over 9 or 1.85. Then we have the width and we have the height. Then we have DPI. The main reason I have not changed these to millimeters 
is actually because DPI, which is dots per inch, is done with an imperial measure, then we'll have use current level settings. Use current level settings will work with raster levels and will allow you to change the camera's aspect ratio to the aspect ratio of that level. This will not be affected by vector levels. Vector levels will allow you to work in any aspect ratio without affecting your quality. But very often you are not going to be using vector levels, you're going to be using raster levels. And therefore you actually want to make your raster levels as big as possible so that you do not lose detail if you have to shrink things down. It's always easier to shrink something down than have to make something bigger. The basis of what these settings are is what is referred to as the aspect ratio. And there are a couple of aspect ratios which you must know and understand in order to choose what you are going to do with your project. The first aspect ratio to know is 4 over 3, which will also occasionally be represented as 1, 3, 3, 1, or as 1. This aspect ratio is the aspect ratio of 35 millimeter film. It is the original aspect ratio with which all film was shot. When television was created, television used this aspect ratio because it was what film was shot on. And in order to compete with television, Hollywood then made widescreen aspect ratios. This aspect ratio was adopted by computer manufacturers and was the main aspect ratio used for the manufacture of computer monitors for a long time as well. So there is a lot of work which you would be working with which may well use this aspect ratio if you're dealing with anything which is historic and there are still cameras which film in this aspect ratio. The next aspect ratio is 16 over 9, which can also be represented as 1, 7, 7, 1, or 1 1.7777. This was the aspect ratio for HD. There were a lot of fights for what the aspect ratio for HD would be, and what was initially planned for HD was to be the same aspect ratio as cinema. What was eventually decided on was 16 over 9, which is very close to what is the most efficient for the human field of vision which is slightly smaller than the cinema aspect ratio. Most computer monitors will use this aspect ratio. The next important aspect ratio is 1, 8, 5, 1. This is one of the standard aspect ratios for feature films and has been in use in feature films since the 1950s. This is the most likely aspect ratio to be using when making a feature film next aspect ratios to pay attention to are 2, 35, or 2, 39, which are used for cinemascape or widescreen film. 2.35 is more common in film industries like Bollywood, where 239 is more common in the West. The vast majority of these aspect ratios are available in the drop down list of aspect ratio settings. As you'll see, 4 over 3, 16 over 9. If we go down further, you'll find 185 and 235. 
an aspect ratio which is not included here is the DCI 2K and 4K aspect ratio. DCI stands for Digital Camera Initiatives and this is a reasonably new standard which is used for movies for digital film. Now the primary reason to be interested in DCI 2K and DCI 4K is this. If you're going to release an animated short for being published on the festival circuit, you are going to want to meet the Academy minimum resolutions. At certain festivals they will not show films that do not meet the Academy's base regulations. At the moment the Academy's base regulations for the minimum required for digital protection is 2048 by 1080 pixels which is basically DCI 2K. So if you are wanting to do a serious short film it is best to make sure that your film is shot at more than this resolution and this resolution is slightly larger than the standard cinema aspect ratio of 1.85. This aspect ratio is closer to 1.9. Now DCI 2K and DCI 4K are going to be registered in future versions of OpenTunes but they are not currently registered in this version which I'm using here. So I'm just going to create a DCI 4K camera for this project. So now I'm going to set the aspect ratio. To start that I'm just going to set the width which will be 4096. Then I'm going to set the aspect ratio which will be 4096 by 2160. And now I've set my aspect ratio and if I zoom out you'll see that it now covers my entire light table. What we'll change next is we'll change the DPI. The DPI will affect how any image you have is represented in OpenTunes. Any image which you import, if the DPI is different from the DPI in the scene, it will be a different scale. In this case I'm going to work with powers of 2. One of the advantages with DCI is it is based off a power of 2 because 4096 is a power of 2. Change the DPI, I'm going to lock the aspect ratio and I'm going to set the DPI to 256. You'll now see that my drawing fits within the light table. Bear in mind that this is a very high resolution and some computers may struggle to handle it. The next thing we'll do is we'll save our resolution by clicking Add and then I will just name my resolution DCI 4K. And now if ever I want to use that preset resolution in the project, I can just use the preset from the drop-down list. The next thing we'll have is these options frame start, end and step, and shrink. For your final render, you do not want to change these. These are for testing. Basically, you can do a subsection of your scene with the frame start and end. You can render out sections of the scene with the start and end, and you can render the scene with a step. So you could render the scene by only rendering every second frame or every third frame. And then beneath that is shrink. So to show you what shrink does, what we will do is just render out something. So if we go here and render, what we will see is we have this image rendered out. If I put up shrink to 50 and then render again, you will see that we have a much, much smaller image 
which has went from 4080 by 2160 to 82 by 44 pixels. These will allow you to get a very quick render if you're testing basic things with animation, but they will make your final render quality worse. So make sure you set them to be 1111 if you have changed them before going to your final render. After camera settings, we will have file settings. The first thing which you will see in file settings is where you are going to have your renders saved. The standard is outputs, so when you make a project, it will usually put them over here under outputs. That output is basically referring to whichever output you put in this project directory. You can also set a separate directory if you choose. Then we will have the name of the file, which is the file which you're rendering out. The file's name format will be like this. It will be the name of the file, a dot, then four numbers, and then the extension. Then we have the file extension, and then we have the options. We click down on file extensions, you'll get the list of file extensions that we have available. The first one in the list is 3GP, which is a video format which was designed for mobile phones. Most people are not going to use 3GP very often anymore. After 3GP, we have AVI. AVI is one of your standard export options for exporting as a movie. You will have options depending on what codecs you have on your computer. Generally, it is best to leave AVI codecs as uncompressed. After that, we have bitmap, which is a standard bitmap image. Then we have JPEG. Now, I would never recommend to export any graphics as JPEG. JPEG is a terrible format to use if you are doing any form of digital art and it is best to stay away from it. The reason is simple. JPEG uses compression, but the compression which JPEG uses loses information. So everything which you're rendering out or saving in a JPEG is going to be a loss in quality. It doesn't matter what form of compression you're using, JPEGs are always losing quality. If you're going to use an image file for export, use an image file which does not lose information. Personally, the image format which I would recommend, especially with open tunes, is PNG. After JPEG, we have MOV or MOV, which is Apple's QuickTime format. After MOV, we have NOL. NOL is a Nokia format, it is a phone format, and essentially it is a GIF. It is not a format which I would use, it's more of a legacy format for your phone systems. Next we have PNG, which would be what I would personally export as. The reason I would choose PNG above the other formats is that with OpenTunes, PNG will give you the best support for transparency. If you're doing any compositing or color grading outside of OpenTunes, you are going to want to have proper transparency with the images, and PNG will give you the best out of all the formats in OpenTunes. After PNG, we have RGB and SGI. Both of these are legacy formats. They are silicon graphics formats. Silicon graphics were the most important hardware manufacturers for computer graphics in the early 90s and most feature length animation was done on silicon graphics machines. However, silicon graphics lost their place in the market and basically closed down. So the main reason to use RGB or SGI will be for legacy files. So more often than not, you can ignore them. 
After RGB and SGI, we have TGA, which is an uncompressed image format. I would recommend using PNG instead, just because of the transparency issues. After TGA, we have TIFF, which is the standard format used by OpenTunes. Then we have Resample Balance. Resample Balance essentially works in a similar way in 2D as what you have for sampling in 3D. It is not as important as with 3D, but it can still affect the final look of your image. The time resample balance will be most important will be if you're using a raster image which is being scaled. To give a rough idea of what resample balance does, say we have an image over here, and this image has four colors. Now if we were to scale this image down so that it was taking the area of this block over here, what you would have is you would have these four colors shrunk into the size of this block. But if the computer is only rendering in these four blocks, so say this bigger block over here and these four over here, it is going to need to decide what color it is going to make this block out of the colors which have been scaled. And that is what Resample Balance does. With your final render, I would never use Standard over here. I would always use High or one of the other options. And I'm just going to give you a chart to give you an idea of what these values do. I do not know whether any of this will be visible in the video. I've tried to make as clear an example as possible, but the effects can be reasonably subtle in some of these examples, and the effects of sampling is nowhere near as dramatic in 2D images as it would be with a 3D renderer. The first two examples are standard and high. Your standard sampling is usually what is referred to as box sampling, which is where an average will be taken of all the sub-pixels which are going to be turned into the final pixel which is seen in the image. Usually if you have variations like this, the number of sub-pixels which are being averaged will create the difference between standard and high. High will give you a sharper and better quality image than standard. Triangle gives you a bit more of a fall-off where it will take the center of the values in the range and read them as more important. Triangle will usually give a slightly softer image and will usually give you a little bit of blurring. What you will see over here in high is that parts of the image will be sharper in high than they will be in triangle, where triangle will give you this slightly blurred, slightly softer image. Then you will have the Mitchell filter. Mitchell filter will use a curve which is similar to this and will give you a much sharper image than your triangle or your standard filter and will emphasize the variations in colors more than either the triangle or the standard filter will do. Cubic convolution is a far more complex algorithm and I'm not going to attempt to try and explain it. It will generally give you a far more blurred image, as you can see over here. This will probably be the most likely image to stand out without careful inspection to be able to see the blurriness. Then you will have hand window, which is similar to the Gauss function. Depending on which renderer you are using, you will usually see one or the other as a possibility for the filters, which will give you a sharper image than the triangle filter but without the color contrast which you will get in the Mitchell filter. The choice of these filters can have an effect in your final scene. They can often be very useful for effects rendering. For example, cubic convolution can be useful for smoke and fog effects. If you are having a character in mist and use the cubic convolution, you will have softer lines and more blurred edges, which will give a more realistic feeling to the mist than if you had a Mitchell filter 
or a standard high quality filter. So that was a very basic and simplified explanation for resample balance. I would not claim it's 100% accurate. I'm not the best person to try and explain Fourier transforms, but it will hopefully give you an idea of what they do, and they can be very useful for the final look of your scene. Next we will have channel width, which will give you the choice of 8-bit and 16-bit colors. The channel width will determine how large the numbers which are used for your colors will be. A 16-bit channel width will allow you to have a much larger color range than an 8-bit channel width. If you're rendering your final version, I personally would use a 16-bit channel width. If you're rendering tests, 8-bit channel width should be okay. But for your final renders, you always want to have as much information as possible. And a larger color width will also be beneficial when working in a compositing or color correction application. Dedicated CPUs will determine how many CPUs your machine will use to do the rendering. Render tile will allow you to use tiles to render your scenes. Generally with 2D animation, you're not necessarily going to need tiles to render, but you can choose to have tiles for scenes which require larger amounts of memory. Then we have other settings. Gamma, I would just leave alone. Dominant field is for if you are rendering for PAL or NTSC. Generally, you will not be rendering for either nowadays. But if you do have to render for a legacy device, PAL or NTSC would then come into account. But you're not really going to use that for more modern devices. Then we have the frame rate, which is how many frames per second you're going to be rendering at. Then we have stretch, which will allow you to have your rendering retimed for a different frame rate. So if you have done your animation in 24 frames per second, but need it at 30 frames per second, you can use the stretch to allow it to scale that frame rate for you. Then we have multiple rendering. Now multiple rendering has to do with the effects and the way the effects work in the schematic. So the options in multiple rendering are FX schematic flows and FX terminal nodes. What these options allow is that if you choose flows, it will render out all of these nodes which are connected to this X sheet node as separate images. But the flows option will exclude a lot of the effects. Terminal nodes will do exactly the same thing, but it will include all the effects as they go into the X sheet. You will generally use the multiple rendering option if you are doing most of your compositing in a separate application. Then we have do stereoscopy which is for stereoscopic rendering, which will allow you to render two separate cameras and will allow you to set a shift for how far apart the cameras are going to be for stereoscopic 3D. The final settings which we'll look at will be under X sheet and under scene settings. Scene settings will basically give you the global settings for everything that happens in the scene. Most of the scene settings I will not change. The most important one is the camera background color. Camera background color will determine what your alpha channel is. So if your camera background color is not transparent, your alpha channels will not show up as transparent if you are rendering in a format which allows for alpha channels. So if you want an alpha channel, I would leave this with the alpha as zero. Most of what's in the scene settings will basically affect what the default values are for your individual levels. Things like the image subsampling and TLV subsampling, if you increase the number, they will show less pixels. So if the subsampling is 2, they will show every second pixel. 
three that will show every third pixel so unless you're having performance issues I would leave those as one the only things over here which will affect the final rendering should be background color and frame rate the rest unless you are having major issues I would not change those so to recap the most important thing we would need when we start the scene would be to set our camera's aspect ratio and when we are doing our final rendering it would be the choice of format the resample balance and the channel width most of the other options will be a bit more specific and will be if you're exporting things to external applications or if you need to retime what you're rendering